Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Bob Moffitt. I'm the senior fellow at the Center for Health Policy Studies here at the Heritage Foundation. And today we're going to discuss a topic that will affect every American physician and every American patient. Um, few Americans are doctors. All Americans are patients. But both are in the grips of a, an increasingly complex healthcare system and regulatory regime that many of them don't even comprehend, let alone control. The latest issue for members of the medical profession is a mandate called the ICD-10. Uh, this is not a product of either Medicare nor, for that matter, the Affordable Care Act. It has been uh, in the wings for many, many years. It nevertheless will create an unfunded mandate uh, for many physicians. Now, obviously, when you say something like ICD-10, most Americans haven't got the foggiest idea uh, of what it is you're talking about. Uh, it does sound a bit ominous, something like uh, perhaps the latest Iranian missile system. <laughs> Did the ICD-10 fall in the hands of Tehran? What does it mean for the West? <laughs> well, it means a lot. The ICD-10 is the International Classification of Disease, 10th edition. It is a coding system uh, for classification and reimbursement uh, for medical services. And on October 1st, uh, the Obama administration will impose it on the entire health insurance system, both public and private. Earlier this week, uh, I got an email from a doctor uh, who will remain anonymous, uh, but she wrote me, and I quote, uh, I called Blue Cross and Blue Shield a few weeks ago to tell them that I'm not doing ICD-10, and I asked them how would it affect me from their standpoint. My representative said she didn't know, she'd get back to me, uh, but she never did. Then I got an email from the Blues today. As of October 1st, those of us who do not comply and implement the ICD-10 will not only be unable to file claims with CMS, that's the Medicare agency, but also the Blues, and I guess all other third parties. Is that right? Has anyone looked at how many doctors and ultimately how many patients this will affect? Am I the only one not doing ICD-10? I dropped United. I dropped Anthem. But are all third-party insurers requiring ICD-10 to file claims? I guess the weaning period is over. On October 1st, it's over for me. Something seems really wrong about this. Ladies and gentlemen, yes, there is a lot wrong about this. In the annual physician survey, 50% of American doctors said that the ICD-10 will cause serious administrative problems in their practices. And that is why my colleagues here at the Heritage Foundation have decided to call attention to it. We have some excellent panelists who will join us today. Our first speaker will be John O'Shea. Uh, John is a senior fellow at the Center for Health Policy Studies here at the Heritage Foundation, and he is also a practicing physician. He's written numerous articles on health policy, in particular issues on payment reform, papers on graduate medical education, emergency medicine, Medicare, and medical technology. Before coming to the Heritage Foundation, he was a visiting scholar at the Brookings Institution. Uh, he also served as a senior health policy advisor to the United States House Committee on Energy and Commerce. Before coming to D.C., he was an attending surgeon and a, a professor of surgery at the Albert Einstein Medical College in New York. Uh, from 2006 to 2007, John was a Harvard University fellow here at the Heritage Foundation. He received his master's degree in public administration from Harvard University as well as a master's degree in the history of science from the University of Pennsylvania. He completed his surgical training at the New York Medical College in New York City. Our second uh, speaker will be Dr. Gerald Harmon. He is a uh, family medicine specialist. He has more than 25 years of specialty uh, training or specialty practice in South Carolina. Uh, he is a, the uh, a member of the American Medical Association Board of Trustees. Uh, he was previously a delegate to the AMA's House of Delegates for all, altogether 18 years. In South Carolina, Dr. Harmon was president of the South Carolina Medical Association 
and in 2007 he received the Order of Palmetto, South Carolina's highest award for public service. Uh, Dr. Harmon, I should mention, also has a distinguished military career. Uh, he, uh, before his retirement in the National Guard and the United States Air Force, Dr. Harmon served America in Operation Desert Shield, Operation Desert Storm, Operation Iraqi Freedom, and Operation Enduring Freedom. Uh, he served there as assistant uh, surgeon and surgeon general. His military decorations include the Distinguished Service Medal, the Legion of Merit, the Meritorious Service Medal, and the Air Force Commendation uh, Medal, and the Human Humanitarian Service Award. Uh, he received his undergraduate degree in physics and mathematics at the University of South Carolina, and he received his medical degree from the Medical University of South Carolina. Uh, he practiced uh, his training uh, at uh, the United States Air Force Base in, uh, at Eglin Air Force Base in Florida. Uh, our third speaker is John Grimsley, uh, who is a second year medical student here at Georgetown University in Washington. Uh, prior to medical school, he earned his bachelor's uh, in science and biology and a master of science in molecular biology, uh, both from George Mason University. Uh, he has spent uh, some time in the biotechnology industry actually doing cancer research. Uh, he served at the Heritage Foundation here as a health policy f graduate fellow, and during his uh, fellowship here, he authored articles on health policy and transparency, and in particular co-authored the paper that we have uh, uh, provided for you today, the new D disease classification system on the ICD-10. Um, finally, our moderator today is somebody who really doesn't need much of an introduction. Steve Hayes uh, is a senior writer for the Weekly Standard. You see him every week on television, I'm sure. He's an author of the New York Times bestseller, The Connection, How Al-Qaeda's Collaboration with Saddam Has Endangered America. He appears on the Today Show, The O'Reilly Factor, Diane Rehm Show, CNN, Late Edition. His writings have appeared in the Los Angeles uh, Times, the Philadelphia Inquirer, the Wall Street Journal, and the National Review. Uh, he, he lives well. Uh, Steve Hayes lives with his wife and two children on the Chesapeake Bay. And I'm not going to tell you where that exactly that is. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, uh, thank you for coming. Uh, I turn this over to John O'Shea, who will give our first presentation. Okay. Thank you, Bob. And um, thank you all for, for your interest in this uh, topic and issue. Um, it's not King v. Burwell, but, but I think it is a significant issue that will impact the medical profession uh, in a negative way, really. Um, I'll keep my remarks kind of brief, um, but one thing I want to say is uh, there are certain, I think, misconceptions about not only ICD-10, but the ICD system uh, in general, and I'd like to make a few comments about that. And as Bob said, you know, it, um, at a time when physicians are asked to do quite a lot of things that, quite a lot of activities that take them away from patient care. They're, they're now being faced with this really unfunded mandate of the ICD-10, which carries with it a significant uh, both financial and administrative burden. And, you know, y you can quibble if you want to about the, the size of the burden. Um, certainly, there have been uh, you know, s studies that have said that, you know, one study, the burden isn't quite as large as one study said. Uh, <clears throat> but I think we've laid out in the paper some pretty good evidence that the, that the burden is really substantial, and I think we'll hear some more um, comments about that. Um, <clears throat> but I haven't seen an article yet or an analysis yet that, that says that there's no impact on physician practices. So I think given that, you have to ask the question, why are we asking physicians and by proxy their patients to bear this burden? And I think one you know, uh, answer to that question that, that's been kind of persistent is that this will somehow lead to better patient care, that will allow doctors to take better care of their patients. Um, so I'd like to take a little bit of a look at, at this aspect of the issue because I think it's really central to the discussion. And, you know, I've been a practicing surgeon now for about 25 years, maybe a little bit longer. And during all that time, I have never once even thought about consulting the ICD coding system to help me decide what was wrong with a patient or to aid me in deciding how to treat a patient. 
So, <clears throat> and I think, you know, to look at this a little bit further as to, you know, how it works in the clinical realm, certainly, you know, a doctor goes and sees a patient, they take a medical history, try and figure out what's wrong, they do a physical examination. They are still teaching physical examination? They are, <laughs> yes. <laughs> So they do a physical examination, they, they order the lab tests or imaging studies that they think are appropriate, and then they come up with a diagnosis and they treat the patient. Now, when all this is said and done, there's the billing process. And during this process, coders, you know, usually not physicians, usually somebody that works at the hospital or is on staff at, at the physician's practice, will go through the patient's medical record, you know, the doctor having documented what they've done in the clinical realm, uh, in, the, in the patient's medical record, the coder will now go back to the medical record and attempt to translate that into certain diagnostic and uh, procedural codes in order for the, for the physician to be reimbursed. Um, <clears throat> so these are two separate processes. The, the billing process does not impact has nothing to offer to the, uh, the clinical realm or, or the care of the patient. And, you know, one argument that I've heard a lot in, in support of transitioning to ICD-10 is, is a knock on the ICD-9 system in the, in, in the sense that it's outdated, it lacks specificity, and you often hear that if a patient has a wrist fracture and they're being treated, they've been treated for a wrist fracture, that IC ICD-9 can't even tell you whether it was the right wrist or the left wrist. Now, certainly in the clinical realm, this is crucial, obviously. In the billing process, unless you're going to reimburse differently for fixing somebody's right wrist versus their left wrist, who cares? It really doesn't matter. So um, <clears throat> I don't think that that's a good reason to impose this you know, unfunded mandate with, with all its financial and administrative burdens on the entire um, medical profession. Um, <clears throat> so I would say that the only argument that, I, that I've heard that's even peripherally related to patient care is the argument that the ICD-10 system with its greater specificity will allow for better research. Um, however, I, I would argue that clinical or their claims data have never been good sources for clinical research. They've never been good sources for that. And when, if you think about it, when a coder goes through the patient's medical record uh, and, and translates what was done into the codes, they don't do it with the intent of providing good information for research. They do it with the sole intent of maximizing reimbursement. So you really have to think that any information that you get from that in terms of clinical research is suspect. So <clears throat> what I would rather see would be uh, an investment in good research tools, such as clinical patient registries and other tools that will lead to much better clinical research. And I think that would be much preferable than an unfunded mandate on the entire medical profession that negatively impacts patient care, that is suspect in terms of its use as a research tool, and <clears throat> may not even improve the billing process. So um, I think that the argument that this is going to lead to better patient care is, is specious at best. So I'll leave my remarks there, and I look forward to questions and discussion afterward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Harmon. Um, thank you all. And uh, I am Jerry Harmon. I, I, I want to thank the Heritage Foundation, uh, Dr. Moffitt, Mr. Hayes, Dr. John, and future Dr. John, <laughs> for allowing me to join you here today. Uh, let me, let me um, give you a moment of background. I, I heard that I'm a family physician specialist in Georgetown County, South Carolina. I'm in a traditional family medicine practice. I've done it for pushing 30 years now. I see patients every day. I make rounds in the hospital. I take call every third or fourth night. I was to, made rounds yesterday. I'll make it tomorrow morning when I go home tonight. So I live, I really live the dream of medicine. It's wonderful. I have a great time doing it. But the ICD-10 implementation, as it's scheduled to occur, will have an impact on myself and my practice. I have an office with three doctors and two advanced practitioners. Um, I'd like to use a very pertinent uh, analogy about the looming ICD-10 implementation. 
I live in a coastal community, and in 1989, we had a hurricane called Hugo. It was devastating. If I could, I'd have a policy that says no more hurricanes. But I know that I have to be prepared for the next disruptive weather system that will occur. I've got to have every effort to mitigate this inevitable damage and to restore my practice and maintain uh, access for patients as soon as possible after the storm hits. For this ICD-10 hurricane, we have a fiduciary responsibility to mitigate anticipated disruption to office sustainability and practice patient care. The AMA has engaged for several years in advocacy efforts to halt implementation of ICD-10. Specifically, we, we believe ICD-10 is, as you've heard, an unfunded mandate on physicians and their practices. To understand the full cost of moving from the current ICD-9 category to ICD-10, we've had an independent third party evaluate this expense for small, medium, and large practices. And it's shown that moving can range from anywhere from $56,000 in cost to a small practice to over $8 million for a large practice. I qualify as a small practice. And, and, and Dr. O'Shea mentioned that there's some discussion about the amount of that impact, but I will tell you that it's real and it's going to happen if it, if it is implemented. The benefits of ICD-10, as mentioned, appear to lie mainly in research and data collection, and it's unlikely in the short term to significantly improve the quality of care for my patient and certainly to reduce overall health expenses in the short term for me. Despite these concerns, Congress and administration are moving forward with an October the 1st implementation date. And we recognize that we're in a minority. Uh, we're a minority voice in opposition to ICD-10. Other healthcare industry stakeholders have invested significantly in preparing for this code set and they support implementation. We therefore believe that we must not only focus on stopping this new code set, but to consider mitigation strategies that will avoid widespread disruption to physicians and to patients. The hurricane analogy. If ICD-10 implementation proceeds, we think at the very minimum that policymakers should consider the following options. Provide a transition period in which claims are not denied or recouped based upon the specificity of ICD-10 coding. We'd like to see the creation of hardship exemptions for those willing uh, whose billing software or claims processing clearinghouses are unable to make such a smooth transition. And we'd like to expand the appeals process for other, med uh, other Medicare quality reporting systems such as Meaningful Use, PQRS, those are all metrics for value-based medical care in the event that payment penalties are imposed due to incorrect calculations as a result of ICD-10 implementation. To focus on this transition period, Right now, current law requires all doctors, all hospitals, and any other covered entity to simultaneously, at the stroke of midnight on October the 1st, to transition to ICD-10. And trying to have every healthcare practitioner move to ICD-10 at the exact time has to contribute to significant disruptions. It's occurred in the past with other uh, uh, transitions with, related to HIPAA, the Healthcare Portability Act. Uh, physicians in the past have gone without pay for months despite assertions that they're ready and we're prepared for the changes. I'll give you a personal example. Several years ago, my small group covered, converted NPI numbers because of an internal practice change in, in 2010. NPI is a national provider identifier that is based upon uh, a federal number that they assign you, and if you don't have it right, you won't get paid. Simple as that. Uh, we converted. We had a nightmare of a transition. We actually went three to four, up to six months without payment from Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services on our submitted claims. It amounted to over $200,000 for my three doctor and two provider group. We got an emergency line of credit. I took out a personal line of credit mortgage just to meet my financial obligations. I didn't give up. My patients needed me. I've been in the community for over two decades. These are my neighbors and, and I felt the pain of payment disruption. We didn't do anything wrong. We just had payment disruption. At our annual meeting a few weeks ago, the AMA House of Delegates established a new policy. It calls for a two-year transition period for ICD-10 implementation, if it occurs, during which physicians will not automatically be penalized for errors, mistakes, or malfunctions of the system. A transition period like that would allow physicians a learning period. Vendors, contractors could identify common errors. They could provide feedback and resolve system problems without resorting to claim denials that can bankrupt doctors, jeopardize patient access. What we're asking for is a set of training wheels on this new bicycle if we're forced to ride it. Overall, these changes, they come at a time when physicians, as Dr. O'Shea mentioned already, juggling reporting on quality measures, adopting new health IT technology, new delivery payment models, 
Now, larger organizations may have the resources to weather this disruption. Small practices such as mine, walk them off family medicine is what we call it. Still, and, and by the way, surveys still show that most Americans, in most cases, get their care in a small office like mine. Our small office is very much subject to disruption in this technology. We can't handle that much financial impact. Allow me to say finally that we're, we're not stuck in the 19th or 20th century. We welcome this new technology. I'm excited about it. I'm excited about being in medicine. I'm glad John's going to go into it. It's a great career field. We show, our studies show that 80% of doctors are already on electronic records. And they're, now they're on them, but they're not always happy. You'll hear, they're pretty vocal about their, their problems with it, their challenges, their suggestion for improvement. And of those 80%, they overwhelmingly would not go back to paper records. We do embrace it. We just, we're having a hard time being as efficient, delivering the care. Our small town practices understand the potential of health IT and the need for change. We just want to be there for our commitment to our patients. Thanks. Thank you, Mr. Grimsley. Thank you, Dr. O'Shea, Dr. Harmon. Uh, so it's been made uh, abundantly clear the ICD-10 transition will have a, quite a significant impact on the healthcare system. <clears throat> and from this transition, we're likely to see the emergence of both winners and losers. Uh, the losers likely being the doctors and the patients. The winners, on the other hand, likely being various technology vendors who um, can sell their, their services to the physicians who need it uh, in order to transition smoothly, uh, various IT consultants, uh, medical coders, and administrators who are all going to kind of find a new niche in the healthcare system as a result of the ICD-10 system, among other uh, electronic health record uh, uh, requirements. So due to the complexity of this ICD-10 transition, we've seen the emergence of a cottage industry. Um, whose sole purpose it really is to assist healthcare providers um, and payers as well with the ICD-10 transition by providing services such as software upgrades, uh, training of staff, systems optimizations, readiness assessments, um, and, and numerous other things. Now these <clears throat> consultants and technology vendors have clearly found a way to make money off of this opportunity. <clears throat> And it should be noted that these are vital services that these healthcare providers need to make this transition smoothly. And without these, they would have quite a difficult time and, and likely uh, have disruptions in their cash flow um, and possibly have to take out loans, such as Dr. Harmon did and so forth. And I'm not attempting to uh, vilify these companies or those who are making money off of this transition. However, it should be clear that there are entities that have an interest in making sure ICD-10 does move forward and, and they have a, a stake in this movement and this transition as they benefit from it. So in addition to these IT consultants and technology vendors who are selling these products to healthcare providers, we have med medical coders, coders and administrators that are likely to emerge as winners as well from the ICD-10 transition. So with this transition, the medical profession, uh, excuse me, the medical coding profession and healthcare administrators are likely to see an expanded role due to the increased coding complexity and the increased uh, 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 billing process and, and how it will become uh, more cumbersome as we move forward uh, with ICD-10 transition. In fact, some hospitals have already hired some additional coders and administrators to help uh, mitigate productivity losses that they know are going to occur after they transition to ICD-10. So with the coding and administrative profession expanding, certain professional associations also stand to gain ground as they will represent more uh, healthcare workers. As, <clears throat> as we see both uh, uh, these associations grow in influence, the coders and the administrators have their influence grow, and the cottage industry uh, also making money, we see that there are clearly entities that stand to gain from the ICD-10 transition and clearly have a, uh, um, a stake in seeing that it move, moves forward. Uh, it's important to be aware of the, these entities and, and when they speak to the need to move forward with ICD-10, it's important to take what they have to say with a grain of salt. Um, before I finish, I also wanted to touch briefly on another possible um, unintended consequence of the ICD-10 transition, which is potential consolidation within the healthcare sector. Uh, as Dr. Harmon mentioned, a lot of uh, patients still get care from uh, independent small practices. And the advantage to being an independent small practice is you really aren't beholden to anyone but your patients. 
Now, considering the fact that ICD-10 will cause severe administrative burdens and possibly decreased reimbursements, as we, we have outlined in the paper, it's likely that independent private practitioners will have a very difficult time in this transition. They may very well choose to retire or simply join a uh, large practice or hospital system. Now, this is particularly concerning um, since there have been studies on the effect of market consolidation in healthcare, uh, which show that concentration, uh, market consolidation within the hospital sector um, can lead to increased cost of care. Uh, moreover, uh, when doctors have been in private practice and become a hospital employee, there are studies that show their productivity can fall by more than 25%. So these are all very important considerations uh, uh, to be aware of um, with regards to the ICD-10 transition. Excellent. Very good. Thank you very much, uh, all three of you, for those comments. Uh, I think we all learned something. Let me just start with a brief explanation of what I'm doing here, and, and then I'm going to ask a couple questions, and then we'll take questions from everyone else. This is, this is not what I cover. This is new for me. Um, I sort of fell into reporting a story about the ICD-10 transition a little over a year ago when I was doing some basic background reporting uh, on Obamacare. I had a group of, of providers and, and payers and others in the medical profession that I used to call regularly and I would just say, hey, what's going, what are you seeing on Obamacare? I need to, to understand what you're seeing sort of at the, at the family practice level, at the payer level. And the more of those calls I made, the more I had people in this little network that I had tell me, well, here's what's happening with Obamacare. You really ought to look at ICD-10. This is what's going to be causing our problems in the, in the shorter term. And it was a surprising answer for me, uh, mostly because I thought Obamacare was you know, a disaster. And I thought it was something that doctors would be sort of pulling their, their hair out about. Um, in any case, I took an interest in it. I went to an ICD-10 coding uh, training seminar, actually. Um, I did that so you don't have to. <laughs> was talk, about, talk about boring. Um, it was bad. But these, these are exactly the kinds of, of interest groups and experts that Mr. Grimsley was talking about. Um, and, but I, I did learn a lot. I mean, they were, these are people who are professional coders in, in most cases, and they felt ill-prepared for this transition. You're talking about moving from se a universe of 17,000 codes, more or less, to a new universe of 155,000 codes. And many of these codes have no application to anything. I mean, it's literally the case that there are codes for things that have diagnostic codes for things that have never, ever happened in the history of mankind. And the favorite example that you hear from people who talk about this is uh, a code that involves drowning or submersion from burning water skis. <laughs> and you stop and think about that. And it's, you know, for, for people who are part of this debate, it's a familiar code, and I think people get sick of hearing it. But for those who are new to this debate, I think it illustrates just how crazy uh, this has become. Uh, just as a side note, I, I did some research on the drowning and submersion on burning water skis. I contacted the USA Water Ski Hall of Fame and talked to the historian there, somebody who's uh, been in the industry for 60 years, and said, have you ever once heard of anyone drowning because of burning water skis? And this person said, not once in my history. But I didn't stop there. I went to the International Federation of Water Skiing and, <laughs> um, and wakeboarding and talked to the head of their medical committee. Have you ever heard of anybody drowning because of burning water skis? And the answer was no. So this is, as far as we can tell, something that's never happened in mankind, and yet it's, just, it's a part of this ICD-10 code. Uh, let me just stop there and, and ask a question first to Dr. O'Shea. You talked about how coders have, have handled this before. The doctors go through, they, they make their notes, the coders go in and translate it, and then, and then submit it for reimbursement. One of the arguments that I heard from physicians in particular about the transition to ICD-10 is given this vast new complexity, and given the, the potential problems um, in lost revenues, what have you, it, because of mistakes, what you're going to end up having is many, many more coders, but also many more doctors taking the time to do the coding, him or herself. Is that something that you anticipate? Absolutely. So, uh, especially during the transition, you're going to have coders go through the medical record and uh, the, the the amount of time is going to drastically increase where they have to go back to the doctor and say, listen, 
Which code do you think this fits into? I have no idea. Uh, it, there's going to be a whole lot of that. So at a time, again, when physicians are, are, are being taken away from patient care, uh, they're going to have to spend a lot of time more or less becoming sort of coders, if you will. Right. Have, have you seen estimates? Have any of you seen estimates on exactly what kind of time we're talking about here? I can tell you, John, uh, uh, if you don't, Dr. John, but Mr. Stevens, what I have seen, and, and this is from some reports from the healthcare industry it, itself, uh, coders, when they've tried to process or code claims based on ICD-10, spend as much as 17 to 27 minutes, and the percentage is up to 49% more time translating what happened clinically into the new ICD-10 code set. Now, granted, this is still new, and they may get more prolific at it, more uh, uh, expert at it, but just the sheer volume of codes alone is always going to take more time in my opinion. Right, right. So I, I can speak to that real quick. Uh, an actual study was done on this, about a 69% increase um, in the amount of time required. To actually process. To the process to it versus the... ICD versus ICD-9. Yeah. 69% yeah. uh, uh, kind of immediate and then approximately 54% long term. Yeah, that's extraordinary. I, when I spoke with Senator Coburn about this, who was uh, one of the leading movers against this, you know, he said this is going to mean I see fewer patients on a daily basis, several fewer patients on a daily basis when you add up all of that time. Um, Dr. Harmon, I had a question for you. Uh, you spent a lot of time talking about the kinds of things that could be done um, by Congress in Washington to mitigate the effects of this. And I think you said, I, I took notes here, you said we need some training wheels on our new bicycle if we're going to be required to ride it. Does that mean that you're giving up? Are you going to be required to ride it? No, I, but I, it's like the hurricane. You know, I, I know that there's one out there. Whether it's going to make landfall or not, I'm not sure. But I have an incumbent fiduciary responsibility to my patients, to my profession, to my practice, to have preparations just in case. So I'm not going to give up. Our official policy is that we want to deny ICD-10 implementation. But we realize we're in a vocal minority, or a somewhat vocal minority, so we really have to have a reality check here, too. I need some mitigated response just in case. When you say you're in a vocal minority, what, who, who's in the majority? Uh, I think uh, a lot of folks who are already invested a significant amount, including a certain section of doctors, right. have invested a fair amount of training into this situation. I, I, I want to go back to one other thing real quickly. You mentioned about the time element. Even if I don't take the time to code a visit, if I just code something, I find even now with ICD-9, I'm already getting called by the coders to explain, is this chronic congestive heart failure or acute on chronic? Is it left-right or diastolic or systolic heart failure? Was it pre-existing with an MI? I mean, I already have all these questions imposed on me with my time that's non-patient care-centric by the existing coders. If you throw five times as many codes on the new ICD-10 ICD coders, I can only imagine the disruption in my office time or hospital time with my patients, even if I'm not the one doing the coding. I still have to explain it. Right, right. Uh, let me ask this question of you, Mr. Grimsley, and then we'll move to questions from the audience. Given the, the stakeholders that you're talking about, given um, what Dr. Harmon mentions, that some people have invested in this, even people mm -hmm. who are opposed to moving forward with ICD-10 in many cases just to be prepared may have invested significant sums to ease their transition, the transition of their practices toward the system that they think the federal government is going to mandate. What do you do? What do you say to people like that? If, if you're fighting this, if you want to prevent this from becoming a reality, what do you say to the people who have already invested this kind of money or have, or created this software or, well, or it, bought it or used yeah, that's, it. That's tough. Um, but I think um, there's a, you know, the saying in the investment world, you don't throw good money after bad. And so if you're going to have a system that is going to decrease productivity and over the long run, let's say we have it for the next 20 years, if each year we're going to be losing money uh, because we, can see, we can't see as many patients, um, you're going to have to pay for more coders. Um, if you're going to lose money each and every single year, why say, well, we've already invested in it, so let's just keep on investing more money, essentially throwing good money after bad. Um, so I think you eventually have to kind of come to the realization that it's bad money and, uh, and cut your losses. Uh, do we have questions from the audience? Raise a hand. Hi, uh, David Hogberg, National Center for Public Policy Research. Um, ICD-10 
has um, 11 codes for getting bit by a Gila monster. Um, and I, I assume that the reason those are in there is there's an epidemic of people getting bitten by Gila monsters in the southwest of the um, United States. Uh, I hope you could was hoping you could address that, and with regard to the clinical research aspect of that, will that help doctors uh, better inform their patients that they shouldn't play with Gila monsters? Thank you. <laughs> there are also additional codes, not just for b being bit by Gila monsters, if I'm not mistaken. There are actually codes for other contact with oh, yeah, Gila monsters yeah, yeah. in case you bump one, into one or... Bitten the first time, bitten the second, bitten the third, right. bitten and you really belong in you know, Darwin's... Uh, <laughs> right, right. Well, let's, let's answer that question if I can just piggyback on that. One of the things in my five weeks of reporting this story almost full time that I could not get an answer to, and I'm wondering if any of you have any insight into this, is literally who came up with these codes? Who's Somebody somewhere decided that that needed to be a code. And I wanted to know who. And I, I emailed everybody, everybody working on this in the federal government. Uh, I've talked to, to private advisors and consultants about this. Literally nobody over five weeks of research could give me an answer to the simple question, who was responsible for coming up with these codes? And then the secondary question was, well, is this a sick joke? I mean, this is somebody's idea of being funny. Anyway, his question, and if you well, have any insight into mine, that'd be great. I mean, in all fairness, I, I, I think when you look at it, it's, it's a, ultimately a World Health Organization initiative, you know, endeavor. And I, I think that probably accounts for some of the crazy things like Gila monsters and things like that, possibly. Um, <clears throat> The other thing is that, you know, in your everyday practice, you're probably not going to be impacted by those crazy codes, you know, getting sucked into a jet engine, and whether it was the first occurrence or it was, you know, a, a repeat occurrence, all those things. But um, to answer your question, I don't think it's going to improve research one bit. I mean, I think there, there's definitely better ways to, to do clinical research and even to do epidemiological research um, than imposing this mandate. I'm, I'm not a, uh, an expert on, you know, research statistics, but I don't, for one thing, I don't think you need a 100% sample size to, to do good clinical research. So why you would want to um, impose this with all the, all the negative consequences is, is, is kind of confusing to me. I was going to say, I think I could speak to uh, this point just real quick. Sure. Um, another example would be, I think, uh, there's a codes for bitten by a macaw, I believe, and a bitten by a parrot. I think a macaw is a subspecies of a parrot, um, so you have to be able to differentiate between the two um, if you're a doctor. But I think where they've come from, my guess would be you have the WHO and a lot of organizations, professional organizations um, for uh, various biologists who maybe study these type of animals, lobbied for the WHO to put these codes in so they could better, easy kind of track what's going on would be my guess, because there's always a lot of lobbying going on with these large organizations such as WHO when they create something like the ICD-10. What, what I thought was interesting as I looked at this was, th you know, there are codes for parrots, there are codes for macaws, but then there aren't codes for any of a number of other yes. bird species. I mean, there's not a code, as I recall, f uh, for sparrows. Well, there's a code for other type of exotic birds, so if it's not a macaw or Then a it just is lumped into all pigeon? this. But I mean, there, what, what, what struck me in looking at this was that there were codes for virtually everything in theory, but not Real, in reality. I mean, there weren't codes for all of these other things. So if you're trying to be exhaustive, you failed in being exhaustive, but you provided so much detail that you're likely to overwhelm the coders and physicians and others who have to deal with this on a, on a regular basis. Yes, sir. Yeah. Um, I'm Dino Drudia. And the question I have for you, uh, I have two questions. The first one is, if this is due to take effect at the stroke of midnight one October, there isn't much time left if you're going to mitigate it. So what are the, mechan the legal mechanisms by which the, the ICD-10 could be stopped or mitigated? And my second question is, I think I'm hearing that the number of codes is going from 17,000 to 155,000, which is an order of magnitude difference. How will this affect the qualifications of the persons who, who do or who in the future will be expected to do medical coding. Will this go from something a high school diploma person can do to something that requires, for example, an associate's degree? Good questions. Anyone? 
Well, I, I would just say that, you know, again, I, I think in, in everyday practice, you, your coder, I, I mean, when you look at it, most s specialists have a certain relatively finite number of diagnoses and, and, and services that, that they're involved with on a day-to-day -day basis. So I don't think every coder is probably going to have to know the 155,000 codes. But I think that even in, with that limited uh, number of codes that they're going to have to do on a day-to-day -day basis, I, I think the complexity has increased so much exponentially that there's going to be s uh, real difficulties in getting even expert coders up to speed that there won't be significant disruptions in patient care. If I'm sure, uh, I may, uh, Mr. Hayes. I. Uh, that's a very good question. I, I, Ninety days away now is what we're looking at. Uh, that's the reason we were asked if we given up. No, but ninety days is a very short window. We have to do something. We're asking uh, the Center for Medicare and Medicare Services, and I think we're getting some echoes of response that they allow us some hardship exemptions for small practices that may fi face the reality of not enough resources, not enough technology support to make the transition to an ICD-10 coding system. We're looking that, uh, and, and legally, this is an, um, Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services is fairly responsive at times to us, and we appreciate that. There, you have to be, have reality here. I would tell you that I use the analogy of a hurricane. If we're doing it all for all enterprises at the stroke of midnight on 1 October with the hospitals, all the doctors and all, maybe we can change that a little bit. Why do we pick this hurricane to hit at high tide? Why don't we self-direct the time and ask it to, maybe the hospitals do it for a while and they get their bugs out of their system and then the doctors do it sometime following on. If, if we're going to be forced to have this hurricane, let's choose some of the options that are make it less disruptive. All those are on the table, I would hope. Yes, hi, Paul Kaminar. I represent uh, Congressman Trent Franks and 50 members of Congress in a uh, case uh, challenging Obamacare under the origination clause. Uh, and, and I know it was said that this was not due to Obamacare, but um, with respect to the ICD, my question, I guess, is to Dr. Harmon uh, in terms of how does this ICD-10, and by the way, I hear that ICD-11 is already being tried out in Europe, so if you like ICD-10, stay tuned. Uh, my question is how does this compare with the current CPT coding, which the uh, uh, AMA has uh, been having the monopoly in terms of making some $72 million a year just on the royalties of having that coding system. So uh, we know, does the AMA have an interest uh, this financially in the ICD? But I'd like to know what's the difference between these two coding systems. Well, thank you, sir. The, the CPT is current procedural technology, and it is, as you indicate, uh, for billing, it's, uh, it's used to code procedures that are done in the hospital or the office setting. It is linked right now to the ICD-9 ICD system uh, just because it's there. And if you mention a short window of opportunity, then we don't have time to delink it or come up with any other payment system. That's not realistic. I think the concern is, is not about the CPT. It's, it's about the operational impact on my practices on patient uh, access to care for the hospitals if we throw ICD-10 into the mix that already is, it's working fairly well with ICD-9, CPT-10, or CPT linkage. I just don't see that ICD-10 is going to be anything other than disruptive right now. If there is a new payment, an alternative payment methods are being looked at. A lot of enterprises are looking at that. I don't think we're going to get a new payment system before 1 October no matter what we do. So we have to ask to stop ICD-10, and if it's implemented, mitigate its damage. So how about the AMA's financial relationship? Well, I, I know you mentioned some facts there, I, and I'm not dodging that. I'm just saying that's not at risk here. What's at risk here is the impact on me as a doctor with ICD-10 implementation. That's a long-range discussion we can have, but I'm worried about my practice surviving it. David Burton with the Heritage Foundation. I have some questions regarding the administrative law process, how, how we got here. In principle, under Executive Order 12866, uh, the agencies are required to do cost-benefit analysis. And that raises a couple of questions, and the first being what did they claim were the benefits that outweighed the cost that, that you all have outlined? 
And secondly, from time to time, uh, people have been successful in challenging the cost-benefit analysis in court. And to your knowledge, is anyone considering challenging the uh, cost-benefit analysis that was undertaking in the proposed and final rule? And as you know, closely related to that is SABRIFA, the Small Business Regulatory Fairness Act, which requires them to consider regulatory alternatives that uh, reduce the cost for small entities. And I was wondering, and again, that, that's subject to judicial review and can be challenged in court. So I was wondering, basically, whether you know of any potential legal challenges and what benefits the agency uh, uh, enumerated in their CBA in the proposed and final rule. Well, Mr. Grimsley, you go through in this paper some of the, the uh, ostensible or potential alleged benefits. Yes. Um, we do cover some of the alleged benefits. Um, they aren't necessarily a cost benefit analysis that, that, we, uh, that we speak to, um, but some of the alleged benefits that the ICD-10 will bring. Um, with respect to legally challenging the, the cost-benefit analysis, I don't know if I can really speak to that um, very well. I'm not knowledgeable enough on that, in that kind of that, so that area. Anybody considering I haven't heard of anybody challenges? considering that, um, challenging that, and I, I also don't know um, really kind of how, how that would go about being done uh, either. Um, that's not really something I'd, I'd be able to help with. Dr. Harmon, is that, is that anything that has been up for discussion in the AMA? No, and I was just looking through my research. I don't think I can quote a particular study, uh, Mr. Hayes, that says we've done that. Uh, mm. So I'd have to say I'm not aware of it right now. Hi, Nino Trenka with the Heritage Foundation. What are the prospects of Congress stepping in? I think um, last year the result was that they provided a one-year delay. What are the prospects of any congressional intervention at this point? Or is most of the intervention going to be in negotiations with CMS? Well, recent activity has been uh, hearing at the Energy and Commerce Committee, and uh, they were pretty strongly in support of the transition to ICD-10 on October 1st. So I think it's, on Capitol Hill, it's certainly an uphill battle. But of course, a lot depends on the kinds of discussions and, and resources that are brought to bear in, in the public sphere between now and then, I would argue. I mean, I think people would have said the same thing about the prospects of a one-year delay if we had asked them at this time last year. And the one-year delay happened in part, I think, because there was some additional attention brought to the issue and people spoke about the kind of potential consequences that, that you three have talked about. We have other questions down here on the right. Natalie Johnson, I'm also with the Heritage Foundation, I'm not sure. Um, in terms of the impact on patients, obviously it's going to impact time and cost. Are there any estimates on that or vague estimates? Um, it's clearly impacting the practitioners, but what is the cost to patients? Well, I mentioned uh, we actually, the AMA uh, uh, asked for a study in uh, 2000 and. Uh, 14 that described, and I mentioned small and medium and large practices. The small practice uh, cost was about 56,000 uh, to over 8 million for large practices. Large practices, 500 or more providers. I will tell you, subsequent to that, we've seen some studies, and uh, I think Dr. O'Shea mentioned it, alluded to in his opening comments, that have reduced that cost in real numbers, they think, to as low as five or 10,000. And I've read those studies, and I'll tell you, the five or 10,000 that they're talking about and the impact on, let's say, my office is probably the cost of another phone line or another keyboard or something for my computer. Because I promise you the disruptive reimbursement threat is more than five or 10,000. That may be one or two claims that bother me. So I think the real disruptive cost to my practice could be a denial of claims of two or three months because I'm not able to enter the, the data appropriately for the receiver to pay me accurately. And I'm real concerned about that reimbursement disruption as much as anything else, and that can measure easily you know, in hundreds of thousands of dollars mm -hmm. for a small practice. So it's real money. It really has an impact potential. Right, but is that cost being passed on to patients? Well, it can't be. Okay. 
and I, I don't mean to cut you off, but we can't pass that along to patients. This is Medicare and Medicaid patients. I have a cost, I have a charge limit. I can never pass Medicare and Medicare cost along to a, a Medicare patient. So I'm, I have a fixed amount I can charge them. Uh, it, it's set, so I can't ever raise the price. And I really have enough contracts. I have very few cash paying patients in my practice uh, for numbers of reasons, and not the least of which is the Affordable Care Act. Now folks have access to health care at some uh, level, even if they may have a high deductible. So I've limited negotiating room in my office for raising prices. Now it may be that other folks could pass along to patients, but that's the reality of when I say economic uh, threat to me, including uh, financial insolvency, it's real. I just can't raise prices. So, and I, I think one, one of the effects on patients could very well be not just, you know, in, increased costs to them, and it, as Dr. Harmon said, you can't pass the, the costs on, but access to care. So if, if a doctor can't, can't see three or four patients that day, <coughs> or if, if a doctor decides that it's not worth the hassle anymore and I'm just going to retire early, that's going to affect access to care. So I think that's going to be a big effect on patients. And uh, just to kind of piggyback off of that, I, was, I mentioned in my opening remarks uh, the possibility of healthcare uh, market consolidation. And so that can decrease, further decrease uh, physician productivity and further decrease patient options. Um, and that could have a quite significant impact on patients as well. Donald? Yeah, hi. Um, I'm Dan Pagana of the Healthcare Leadership Council. And um, my question is uh, concerns vendors. Uh, how can you see vendors playing more of a proactive role in the like, transition, if if you can see any? Well, I'll uh, I, not to usurp the time of the microphone, but as a practicing doc and Dr. O'Shea is too, what I've already seen in my vendors is they have offered me the opportunity. I use an electronic record. I'm in my third year now of painfully migrating paper to electronic records, and, and I'll confess to going in the room with a chart still. I'm one of, the, of my younger doctors. I'm the only one still uses a chart. They go in with a laptop. I just can't bring myself to look at a computer screen when I'm talking to you about your abdominal pain or headache or something. Uh, but I will go in there and take notes, and I'll go back and transcribe it into my electronic record. My vendor uh, has offered to give me training on ICD-10. I've tried to participate. I've been through about 10 percent of their required training, so I'm I'm learning more about ICD-10 implementation, admittedly grudgingly, because I'd like to not see it occur. But I, I have to prepare for that hurricane. Um, they're giving me a pretty good price. They are. They are, however, uh, charging me for upgrades to allow me to transition from ICD-9 to ICD-10. It's not free, so there'll be a cost there. And uh, as Natalie asked, I can't price it. I can't price it to my patients, so I just have to eat it in my overhead. Um, and, and all of us have to pay that extra money. It's, um, we asked the vendors to be better teachers. We asked them to make available the, the new modules. And they're trying, so I'm not throwing them under the bus here. But it's, a, it's an industry-wide problem. Do you, do either of you, to um, Dr. O'Shea or Dr. Herman, have a sense of uh, how many of your colleagues, how many practicing doctors have started this transition? Uh, I know when I wrote my piece a little over a year ago, the, the number was alarmingly low, and you had, I think, the sentiments expressed in the email that Bob Moffat read to, to get us started today were widespread. People said, I'm not doing this. I don't care. And then they learned, well, sort of, you have to do this. How many uh, of, of your colleagues or people that you know um, have gone through some kind of training or have started the process or have bought the software? I think mean, most of the uh, physicians that are, that are started the transition are, are part of a larger organization. Mm -hmm. uh, so, so they tend to be more um, the, the providers that have, are, are ready, if you will. Uh, it's the smaller practices that really haven't, are, are really not ready for this. And, you know, estimates are that maybe 60, 70, 75 percent of small practices are just, haven't started, are not ready to go on October 1st. Significant. Stephen, the best number I've seen is 11% are prepared. So doing quick math, that's not a good number they're prepared. So, so maybe not to end on a thoroughly depressing note, <laughs> but we might as well because we're, we're staring this in the face. So in 98 days, which I think is, is what we're talking about, so, so 99 days, October 2nd, this happens. It's not delayed. The, there's no legal uh, effort to stop it. What happens? 
on October 2nd? I mean, is this something that the, that the you know average patient will see on October 2nd and it will be horrible, or is this going to be sort of a a running stream, a running parade of horribles? What what do we expect to see on October 2nd and, and November 2nd and December 2nd? I think the potential is there for a, a real disaster. I think when they flip the switch on October 1st, um, you may not see it for a few weeks, but certainly as you, as you um, submit claims and you're not reimbursed for the services you provided and your cash flow starts to dwindle, uh, I think there's going to be there's the potential for some significant problems that I think, you know, there's a lot of, even the physician organizations, a lot of them have just sort of resigned themselves to the fact that, that this is coming and they're sort of preparing their membership to, uh, to deal with it. But I think even so, I think this has the potential for a real disaster, to be a real disaster. I don't know what you think, Dr. Arnold. I do know what you think. <laughs> I think you've heard it. But I, I, I agree with, uh, Dr. O'Shea, uh, Mr. Hayes, what we're looking at is the average patient, it'll be transparent to them. They won't notice a close for business sign on October the 2nd in my office, nor on hospitals or anything else. But they'll notice, I think, that they will be frustrated, I anticipate, if, if CMS and cannot uh, deliver on what they're talking about. Not just CMS, you know, it's, it's CMS is the, the gorilla in the room, but it's all the private administrators as well. Yeah. You know, the, the traditional uh, payers, uh, they haven't done as much end-to-end -end testing, to my knowledge, as CMS has done. End-to-end -end testing is where they've actually had some trials. And even at the end-to-end -end testing, it's it's done by CMS with vendors and or providers who say they're ready. So their end-to-end uh, -end testing acceptance and success rate is less than, in some instances, less than 80%. So that means 20% error rate. And if you're talking about 20% of not getting your claims paid, that's a big a big error rate, and that's just for the prepared folks. And, and I would also say about the CMS testing is that, you know, it's fine for CMS to be ready, but if the practices aren't ready, then, you know, CMS being ready does, doesn't really solve the problem. We've heard CMS was ready before. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We I can just be very cynical about this. Okay, this is truly the last question. We'll go down the row, starting with Mr. Grimsley and working your way this way. I had somebody who's been working on the ICD-10 transition say to me last year, I'm going to read it so I get the quote exactly right, this is probably going to be the most painful year in the history of U.S. healthcare. Is that true or is that an exaggeration? Uh, it may very well be true. Um, I mean, there's a lot of evidence that points towards that that may very well be true. I mean, it, as we talked about the uh, fact that physicians' practices may close, you may have uh, increased waiting times for patients. Um, you know, uh, resources being allocated towards non-patient uh, centered needs uh, amongst hospitals and practices. So yeah, I think it, it, it could be. I guess we'll find out, but it very well could be. Well, I'm hoping it won't be painful. Uh, it, it, if ICD-10 occurs on October the 1st, there will be some disruption. It'll be up to our talent, our, our abilities and the flexibility of the system to mitigate that pain. I do think that there is a real risk of a huge disruption in, in patient care time. I really do. I, I think it very well could be. Uh, if you're talking about pain to practicing physicians, I think it very well could be. And I think it w w not just the next, this year, but probably the next five, even to 10 years, yeah. could be painful. I don't think it has to be, but it certainly could be yeah. painful. Well, this has been thoroughly depressing, but also <laughs> highly informative and very helpful in, in making sure that we all understand what may happen on October 1st. So join me in a round of applause for the panelists.